Hello and welcome to Vice Rhino's channel, Jackson Weed here. Today we're going to look at a video that I've received several requests to debunk, but since it overlaps in content with several videos I've done on my channel, I have refrained from offering a response. However, we're on Vice Rhino's channel, and I think now is a perfect time to take apart this video. So let's go! Yet at the same time, when he published The Origin of Species in 1859, paleontologists had bad news for him. The fossil record showed very clearly that new species appear suddenly and abruptly and not by evolving in small step-by-step -step fashion over long periods of time. For this reason, the most prominent paleontologists at Darwin's time rejected his theory. The issue was not that there were some minor inconsistencies here and there between Darwin's theory and the fossil record. No, it was that the science of paleontology as a whole and everything paleontologists knew presented a picture that was diametrically opposed to the one Darwin tried to paint. Before getting into my rebuttal, I have to point out that I skipped both the intro and the section summarizing Darwin's theory. The reason I skipped the latter is that his explanation of evolution by natural selection is surprisingly good for an ID proponent. Things, however, go downhill quickly thereafter. First, I'll grant that in Darwin's time very little was known about the fossil record. Naturalists were just barely beginning to understand that the ancient world was filled with strange creatures unlike anything alive today. When Darwin circumnavigated the globe, only two fossil mammals were known from South America the sloth, Megatherium, and bones that would later be assigned to the Gomphothere cuvieronius. Darwin's trip to South America greatly expanded the number of fossil mammals known from the continent in addition to various fossils of shells and plants. See my video Darwin's Evidence with Guts at Gibbon for more information. Even the term dinosaur was only 17 years old by the time Darwin published Origin of Species. The little that was known about the fossil record seemed to show an age of fish, followed by an age of reptiles, and followed by an age of mammals. The three naturalists that deflate shows, Agassiz, Murchison, and Sedgwick, all held to a form of creationism that involved God progressively creating species. The idea of one species giving rise to another was totally rejected. However, essentially all modern ID proponents, as well as the vast majority of young earth creationists, accept speciation today. So, agreeing that some naturalists rejected Darwin's conclusions, others did agree with Darwin, even helping Darwin support his theory. I'll give a couple examples. The first and most prominent example is Archaeopteryx. Discovered in 1861, just two years after Origin of Species was published, Archaeopteryx showed characters intermediate between reptiles and birds. It had feathers like birds, but a long bony tail, teeth, and unfused fingers just like reptiles. In 1883, paleontologist Othniel Charles Marsh wrote in his book, Birds with Teeth, quote, When first discovered, Archaeopteryx, notwithstanding its feathers, was thought by some anatomists to be a reptile, mainly because it differed from all known birds in having a very long reptilian tail and the bones of the hands separate from each other. This view is held by some authors at the present time, but the best authorities are now agreed Archaeopteryx is a bird, close quote. However, Darwin was enthralled by Archaeopteryx, including it in later editions of Origin of Species. Darwin's own analyses of Glyptodon and Megatherium put in his mind that animals similar yet different to modern ones lived nearby their extant relatives, adding a time dimension to biogeographic distributions. And while writing his books on barnacles, Darwin found evidence for a gradual change in the barnacle Scalpellum arcuatum writing, quote, there is a slight difference between the specimens from the upper and lower stages, which some authors might perhaps consider specific. In other words, other barnacle experts considered the barnacle in question to be two different species from start to end of the fossil sequence. By the sixth edition of Origin of Species in 1872, Darwin included the fossil Cyrenian Halotherium, which had rudimentary hind limbs, the fossil whales Squalodon and Basilosaurus, the latter of which had rudimentary hind limbs as well, and the three-toed fossil horse Hipparion. Darwin wrote, quote, No one will deny that the Hipparion is intermediate between the existing horse and certain older ungulate forms, close quote. 
Indeed, by the sixth edition, Darwin was confident enough in the fossil record to declare that the, quote, great leading facts in paleontology agree admirably with the theory of descent with modification through variation and natural selection, close quote. So much for Deflate's suggestion that nothing in paleontology supported Darwin. Darwin himself was painstakingly aware of that, and he expressed his discomfort repeatedly in his book, like here for example, as according to the theory of natural selection, an interminable number of intermediate forms must have existed. Why is not every geological formation charged with such links? Darwin's response to the question of where are the transitional fossils was that the fossil record is extremely imperfect and very few fossil sites have been discovered, which Deflate will mention shortly. Paleontologists do still consider the fossil record to be highly imperfect due to such forces as erosion, but we have far more transitional fossils catalogued today than Darwin did. I wonder if Deflate is going to mention any. Just kidding, I already know he doesn't. Or here, the abrupt manner in which whole groups of species suddenly appear in certain formations has been urged by several paleontologists as a fatal objection to the belief in the transmutation of species. If numerous species have really started into life all at once, the fact would be fatal to the theory. Actually, even if the fossil record did look like it were filled with abrupt starts, or even if we had no fossils at all, that wouldn't be evidence against evolution. We could have zero fossils. But the evidence from genetics and biogeography alone would be enough to vindicate evolution. And what was Darwin's response? I can answer these questions and objections only on the supposition that the geological record is far more imperfect than most geologists believe. Only a small portion of the world has been geologically explored. So Darwin asserted that paleontologists simply hadn't unearthed yet the interminable number of intermediate forms his theory predicted to exist, hoping that the future of paleontology would change that and vindicate him. In other words, he was essentially making an argument from silence and explained away the absence of evidence instead of explaining the evidence scientists were actually facing. That is, the fact of new animal forms showing up suddenly and abruptly in the fossil record rather than gradually. As mentioned previously, Darwin did consider the fossil record to support his theory, but his point was that there isn't an interminable number of transitional fossils in the record because the fossil record is imperfect. Even for organisms that have actual species-to-species -species transitions in the fossil record, like foraminifera, radiolarians, coccolithophores, the sea urchin micraster, as well as some vertebrates like Hyopsidus and Haplomylus, the fossil record is still imperfect. It's never going to be perfect. It's also important to remember that though anti-evolutionists like to hype up Darwin's concerns over the fossil record, fossils were never Darwin's main argument for evolution. He considered the arguments from biogeography, homology, and embryology to be far more persuasive. It's also worth noting that over 99% of Earth and life scientists accept evolution today, so clearly, modern paleontologists do consider the fossil record to support evolution. This is because Darwin was correct when he stated paleontology was in its infancy during his time, and that future discoveries in this field would lend more support. This wasn't an argument from silence, it was a prediction that he made, and he was right in the end. And indeed, numerous transitional fossils have been discovered, although Deflate has something to say about that. Had you lived at the time of Darwin and were excited about his theory, you might have joined him in hoping that those innumerable intermediate forms in the fossil record would be unearthed later on. Have these hopes come true? Nope. On the contrary, the fossil evidence that has surfaced has made Darwin's problem much more severe as we are about to see. That was just, to put it bluntly, completely false. His claim is that the discoveries of the Cambrian explosion don't support evolution, but even if I were to grant that, which I don't, the fossil record doesn't begin and end with the Cambrian. There is no way you can imply that numerous transitional species haven't been described after Darwin. The aforementioned Archaeopteryx was a significant discovery in Darwin's time, but today it is just one of many along the dinosaur-to-bird transition. So many, in fact, that there is a degree of ambiguity around where to draw the line between birds and not birds. Even creationists can't tell. Creationist David Menton has said that dromaeosaurs are birds, while other creationists have argued they are dinosaurs. 
The transition from basal amniotes to mammals has been described, even fossils with both a quadrate articular jaw joint and a mammalian dentary squamosal jaw joint at the same time. What about the fish to tetrapod transition, whale evolution, hominin evolution? We can go on and on. The fact is that the Cambrian explosion won't make these disappear. In fact, the Cambrian period itself has transitions to boot. More on that later. In the year 1909, Charles Doolittle Walcott, then director of the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C., discovered the Burgess Shale in British Columbia, Canada, which until today is considered one of the most important finds in the history of paleontology. Walcott's team collected more than 65,000 animal fossils, many of which were remarkably well preserved, belonging to a variety of different phyla. Now, here's an important term you want to wrap your head around. Phyla. What is that? Borrowing Stephen Meyer's definition, the term phyla, singular phylum, refers to divisions in the biological classification system. The phyla constitute the highest or widest categories of biological classification in the animal kingdom, with each exhibiting a unique architecture, organizational blueprint, or structural body plans. This isn't a terrible definition, though it raises some intriguing issues that I'll get to in a moment. First, if you're curious as to why Deflate opted to quote Stephen Meyer, who isn't a biologist or paleontologist, instead of a biologist or paleontologist, the reason is that Deflate is retreading the arguments from Meyer's 2013 book, Darwin's Doubt. I've done a number of videos responding to the central arguments in this book, links in the down part. What about the interesting issues? A phylum, like all Linnaean taxonomic ranks, is an arbitrary construct. There is no objective method to assign specific ranks to groups. But what about body plans? Don't they define phyla? That just kicks the can down the road. The term body plan has the same problem. What exactly is that? You can extend the concept of a body plan outward from one particular phylum to its other closely related phyla. For example, the Hox genes involved in the construction of the arthropod body plan are also present in onychophorans, also known as the velvet worms, and tardigrades. It makes sense then that segmented bodies, limbs, claws, and ventral nervous systems are uniting features of these phyla. In fact, for this reason, arthropods, onychophorans, and tardigrades are commonly lumped together into a superphylum called panarthropoda. So there are actually wider categories within the animal kingdom than just the phyla. Panarthropods are likewise nested in a larger clade with nematodes, nematomorphs, priapulids, and kynorhynchs, called ectisozoa, based on their ability to shed their skin during growth. And what about the even more inclusive group, bilateria, which includes all animals that have bilateral symmetry? Why isn't bilateral symmetry a body plan? Or go the opposite direction. Insects have a body plan that is different from crustaceans, myriapods, and chelicerates. There's nothing wrong with saying this either. It's the reason systematists tend to use clades and terms like crown and stem groups that are defined with objective criteria rather than taxonomic ranks to classify organisms. Here are three examples of three different phyla. The phylum of the arthropods includes all insects, all spiders, all types of crabs, lobster, as well as animals such as the trilobites. The phylum of the Nidarians includes corals, jellyfish, and sea anemones, and the phylum of the chordates includes, among other animals, all birds, all reptiles, all fish, and all mammals. What does a phylum represent to Deflate, or Stephen Meyer, or anyone? To systematists, it's just a signpost meaning that a clade shares a certain set of features. Is that all it means to Deflate? Or are phyla the divinely created kinds? Or is there any reason to use the term phylum at all? I predict that we're not going to get an answer to these questions in this video. In each of these phyla, all the animals, as different as they may look from each other, are united by their organizational structure, which is also the very thing that allows us to differentiate between all the phyla. 
The animal kingdom is usually organized into 35 different phyla and the known fossil record features animals representing about 27 of, sto of those 35 phyla. Of the 27 phyla featured in the fossil record, 20 make their first and sudden appearance within one single geological time period called the Cambrian era, without evidence of fossilized forms in older strata which could be considered their evolutionary precursors. First, brief but important nitpick. It's the Cambrian period, not era. Those are two very different geological divisions. Second, notice that he said eight phyla aren't represented in the fossil record at all. The phyla not represented among fossils are all small, soft-bodied organisms like Nathostomulida, Micronathozoa, Rhombozoa, etc. That necessarily means the fossil record is imperfect unless one wants to defend the position that God created those phyla the day they were found. Good luck with that. Notice though that there are a lot of loose threads in Deflate's argument that go nowhere. He brings up facts and issues that he necessarily has to account for in his own model, but simply doesn't. That's not a bug, it's a feature of intelligent design. Finally on this point, what does Deflate think of the phyla that do appear after the Cambrian, like the rotifers which show up in the Eocene? Were rotifers not around prior to that? Or were they around, but not recorded by fossils? Again, no answer. The Cambrian era is generally held to span from around 540 million years ago to around 490 million years ago. However, the time window in which the 20 Cambrian phyla show up is far smaller and has been calculated to cover no more than 10 million years. In fact, an MIT geochronologist has calculated that at least 16 completely new phyla appear within no more than 6 million years of the Cambrian era. 16 fundamentally different body plans within 6 million years. That's a lot of anatomical innovation within a mere blink of an eye on an evolutionary timescale. This claim about the phyla appearing within no more than 6 million years comes from Meyer's book, Darwin's Doubt. Meyer relies on the paper, Calibrating Rates of Early Cambrian Evolution, published in 1993. Bear in mind, Meyer's book was published in 2013, and Deflate is citing it secondarily almost another decade later. This is how awareness of the scientific literature remains outdated in perpetuity. But what about the paper itself? It talks about a period of slow diversification at the start of the Cambrian between 544 and 530 million years ago, i.e. about 14 million years, which is followed by a period of exponential diversification between 530 to about 525 million years ago, or 5 to 6 million years. That's 20 million years in total. Of course, they cherry pick the latter figure while ignoring the fact that we do indeed observe evolution occurring prior. But it gets worse. The latter figure relies on the age for the at Debanian Batomian boundary, which they take to be 525 million years. The paper is indeed outdated, and that boundary is now dated to about 514 million years ago. This means the exponential period happened from 530 to 514 million years ago, which is 16 million years long, thereby making the total evolutionary diversification of the animal phyla last for about 30 million years. Or 27 million years if you take the current age for the base of the Cambrian period of 541 million years ago. That's quite different from 10 or 6 million years. It gets worse still. When the Cambrian explosion was first described, we only knew it from a limited set of deposits with exquisitely preserved fossils called Lagerstaten. They give us a detailed snapshot of life's history, but a single snapshot doesn't give us a lot of info on what happened before or after. For example, Deflate has mentioned the Burgess Shale, but that deposit dates to 508 million years ago, which is after what Deflate has previously defined as the Cambrian Explosion. If the Burgess Shale is part of the explosion, then the explosion lasted for at least 33 million years. The point is that when exactly the Cambrian Explosion begins or ends is rather arbitrary, since there actually are no clear-cut boundaries where all the animals suddenly appeared, and when new animals suddenly stopped appearing. This is especially made clear by two recent papers. First, this paper from 2018 described two phases of the Cambrian explosion, the first phase from 542 to 513 million years ago that was dominated by stem groups, 
and the second phase that was dominated by crown groups extending all the way into the Ordovician. The second paper from 2019, Integrated Records of Environmental Change and Evolution Challenge the Cambrian Explosion, concludes that a discrete Cambrian explosion is difficult to define, that it was simply one phase among several animal radiations, some older and some younger. Furthermore, 16 phyla? This number's argument is supposed to impress us. How could that many totally different phyla show up so close in time to each other? We have to remember a couple things, though. Deflate has mentioned the arthropod phyla, giving insects, spiders, crabs, and lobsters as examples. Except for the trilobites, these arthropods that you are familiar with appeared much later, long after the Cambrian ended. If you go back in time to the Cambrian before all these distinct subgroups appeared, the arthropods weren't as derived as they are now, and there was much less disparity. In simpler terms, they looked more like each other compared to how the arthropods of today look like each other. For example, the ancient Cambrian relatives of spiders, insects, crabs, etc. had many more segmented limbs and were all aquatic. This is why terms like phyla aren't really helpful since these concepts break apart when you trace lineages back to their common ancestor. This trend continues as the early arthropods were also quite similar to members of other phyla at this time. For example, the panarthropods mentioned previously were separated by very little in terms of morphology at the beginning. The base of panarthropoda is populated by a variety of what are basically worms with legs called lobopods, such as Aishea, Megadictyon, and Hallucigenia. If we decide to pursue the ancestors of arthropods from here, we see creatures with some but not all of the traits associated with the arthropod body plan. These are the stem groups that are predicted from common descent. Some lobopods developed a set of flaps on their trunk segments, such as Carigmachella. Opabinia, Anomalocaris, and Calentia share yet more features in common with arthropods. There is even a group called the bivalved arthropods, which are either derived stem arthropods or basal crown arthropods. Paleontologists have arguments over where exactly this clade falls. These are transitional forms that deflate demands, but simply omits. I've discussed the evolution of other clades during the Cambrian explosion in videos linked in the down part. See those if you're interested. However, I think we should take the appearance of phyla here with a grain of salt. For one thing, as mentioned previously, several phyla aren't present in the Cambrian or in the fossil record at all, so when did they originate? Also, some of the phyla represented in the Cambrian have extremely poor fossil records. The entire phylum of Lorisiferans, for instance, is represented by a single taxon, Eolorica deadwoodensis, which has only been described from one Cambrian locality. Another example, Onychophorans are represented by several Cambrian stem taxa, such as Hallucigenia and Luolishania. But another Onychophoran fossil doesn't show up until the Carboniferous, the still aquatic Helenodora. This gets into a whole debate about the different so-called fuse hypotheses of Cambrian diversification. The long fuse argues that those phyla were around for a long time, but hidden from the fossil record. The intermediate fuse argues that those phyla appeared shortly before the Cambrian, and the short fuse argues that those phyla appeared during the Cambrian. I happen to fall between the intermediate and short fuses, but on a case-by-case -case basis because there is evidence for some clades being present before the Cambrian, like stem mollusks such as Kimberella, stem lophophorates such as Namacalathus, and stem panarthropods such as Yelingia. See my video, Our Precambrian Ancestors, for more information. The Cambrian wasn't nearly as explosive as originally thought. In fact, if we compress the history of life on Earth, which began around 3.5 billion years ago, into a 24-hour day, those 6 million years would make up no more than 75 seconds. Within this tiny time window of 6 million years, the trilobite, that icon of paleontology shows up, a creature with a rather complex body plan that is divided into three parts, a head, chest and tail. It's got three longitudinal lobes across the head, while the chest and tail consist of around 30 segments. However, probably the most impressive anatomical fact about trilobites are their lens-focusing compound eyes, which allow for a 360-degree field of vision. 
That's a brief sketch of the animal most of us probably associate with the word fossil. And it's this animal that arguably exemplifies the paleontological challenge to evolution best. For if Darwin's theory holds true, how did complex animal forms such as the trilobite show up suddenly within a mere six million years with zero evidence of a precursor from which it supposedly evolved? First, sorry, I already provided the answer to that with regard to where trilobites came from. They are preceded by simpler arthropods in the Cambrian and even simpler panarthropods in the Precambrian. Second, there's a bit of confusion in Deflate's argument. He says, quote, For if Darwin's theory holds true, how did complex animal forms such as the trilobite show up suddenly within a mere six million years with zero evidence of a precursor from which it supposedly evolved? Close quote. The trilobites didn't actually show up until nearly 20 million years after the start of the Cambrian radiation, and there are possible soft-bodied prototrilobites known prior to their big radiation. Spergina looks like a soft-bodied trilobite without any eyes, and Yelingia is a long, segmented worm with three lobes on each segment like a trilobite. Although these are probably not direct ancestors of trilobites, it does show that there were creatures with slightly less complex morphology just prior to the Cambrian. The arthropods present at the start of the Cambrian look quite a bit different from trilobites, such as those lobopods and bivalved arthropods mentioned earlier. Not to mention that trilobites went through various evolutionary trajectories throughout the Paleozoic, so they exemplify evolution too. It seems like deflate is trying to conflate the appearance of arthropods with the appearance of trilobites, possibly because he doesn't know the actual extent of Cambrian arthropod diversity. Walcott's phenomenal find in the Burgess Shale in 1909 was a major key that helped paleontologists gain such a detailed understanding of how animals showed up on the stage of life. But it's important to point out that in the 100 plus years that have passed since then, paleontologists have consistently encountered the exact same picture around the world when making new discoveries. A wide variety of animals whose fundamental body plans are as different from one another as that of a jellyfish and a dragonfly make their sudden appearance all at once within a tiny window of time that briefly opened around 540 million years ago. This phenomenon has come to be referred to as the Cambrian Explosion. There's a bit more confusion to untangle and some of it seems to border on disingenuity. He again mentions modern animals like the dragonfly and says that those phyla present in the Cambrian are as different as the modern ones are. That's simply not true. As pointed out earlier, some of the phyla were much more similar to each other in the Cambrian, reflecting their closeness to their common ancestors. And the fossil organisms present in the Cambrian are quite different from many of their extant descendants. Let's look at the chordates, the phylum we belong in. Hycoichthys is considered one of the earliest chordates, but Hycoichthys looks nothing like most chordates alive today. Pretty much all chordates in the Cambrian were like that. It looks a bit like a modern lancelet, but nothing like a Tyrannosaurus or an elephant or a human. The first chordates with jaws did not appear until the next geological period. Likewise, stem arthropods like Anomalocaris were present in the Cambrian, but it looks nothing like a dragonfly. Insects didn't come along until substantially after the Cambrian period. This is important to remember. With the exception of trilobites, Deflate hasn't even mentioned a single group or species that actually lived in the Cambrian, nor how these compare to each other, or to those that came before and after. In case it isn't obvious, my point about disingenuity here is that saying a phylum is present in the Cambrian and comparing that phylum to its modern members does a disservice to people trying to understand the nature of the fossil record and evolution as it actually occurred. And so, that's the end of this dissection. Deflate just keeps going on about his, well, Myers, baseless assertions that the fossil record doesn't reflect evolution, but, as I've clearly shown, it does. Deflate and others like him aren't interested in doing the research to understand the Cambrian fossil record, so it's up to others to do the research for them. When you turn to the final chapter of Darwin's Doubt, it should come as no surprise that it's an altar call to Christianity, because that's what this is really about, not science. Anyway, thanks to Vice Rhino for having me on, and I'll see you next time.